Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm James Milan. This is a talk of the town legislative update with our state senator, Cindy Friedman, who really um, we always appreciate, uh, Cindy, you taking the time to join us. But uh, in December of this crazy, crazy year, um, yeah, you must be running on fumes at this point. So particular appreciation for your being here today. Thank you. Thank you, James. Well, it's always a, it's always a, a pleasure to come and talk to you, and uh, I'm happy to be here. And yes, I am running on fumes, as probably 98% of the state is as well. Well, we appreciate your kind words. Uh, we, we don't expect it to be a pleasure, but we do uh, we do um, appreciate your 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 just you know you understanding that it's important uh, to share. Uh, what's been going on with our audience and you're the best person to do it with. Um, speaking of which, um, I'd like to start with something right top of everybody's minds at the moment and that is the fact that uh, yesterday the FDA gave uh, approval for the first of you know hopefully several vaccines coming uh, available soon and then we'll start the very long process of vaccinating the population. Um, I know that you uh, have been intrinsically involved uh, as part of the COVID-19 advisory uh, committee uh, to give you know, uh, advice and counsel to the governor about how to roll out uh, the vaccine. So can you tell us, first of all, how did that happen? How'd you come to be uh, on that in that group and then in, in Give us an update about, about what has come out of your efforts. Sure. Um, so I think it was about six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago, I was asked to be part of the um, COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Committee. Um, not sure how I got on it, but I did, and I was quite honored to, uh, to be asked. The, I and the, the um, leader of majority leader from the House, um, Rep. Mariano, was also uh, asked to be on it. So we were the two legislators. Um, and uh, it met for uh, yeah, six to eight weeks. It met uh, one, at one point it was twice a week, and then it was once a week uh, for two hours. And it was a group of epidemiologists, infectious disease um, experts, doctors, health, uh, hospital um, folks. Uh, long-term care was on it. Uh, the community community leaders, uh, Reverend Walker was one of those. Michael Curry, who did such a phenomenal job in Arlington and now is the lead, head of uh, Mass League of Community Health Centers was there. So it was a quite a diverse group of people. And our task was, was to develop a rollout plan for the vaccines. And um, which is what we did. And we did a report which came out on the, um, I think it was the ninth, um, it was a couple of days ago, um, and that was given to the governor. And then I think the governor uh, came out with his, uh, so maybe we did it a little earlier, maybe mm -hmm. whatever. And, um, and so he used, they used that to uh, develop a plan, which a lot of people heard about. Uh, I think it was Wednesday. Did he roll it out on Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah, I, think. I think it was, I think it was on Wednesday. Yeah. So that's what um, that was the um, the process and the 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 number one goal for the com for the committee was to um, maximize life and minimize harm and support the most vulnerable and um, to preserve our healthcare system. So. Um, that's that was kind of the ethos and we moved you know within that that framework and came up with the different phases um the phases are important because we are not getting um the the vaccine itself is going to be rolled out so starting hopefully monday we may see about sixty thousand doses and hopefully by the end of the year we're looking at three hundred thousand. Um, but that is not going to in any way, shape or form going to cover everybody. Right. And, um, and so it's really important for us to know exactly how we're going to roll that out, who's going to be in those um, different phases, and then make sure that we can track that that's happening. 
And um, this is a very complicated rollout because there are a number of factors, including uh, the Pfizer vaccine has to be kept at minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And you don't find that at, you know, you can't buy a refrigerator at Costco for that. That's right. Um, and also you need two doses and they have to be, depending on what the vaccine is, somewhere between 21 and 28 days apart. So you get your first dose, but then you have to come back for Pfizer. I think it's um, 21 days later or around, you know, you, you can't get it before 21 days. So there's lots of logistics and, um, and, and lots of challenges to make sure that people who need it imminently get it and that we can keep track of who has it and where so we can make sure that they can get their second dose. Um, we wanna make sure it's equitable across the state and we wanna make sure that the most vulnerable and um, people get it first. Yeah, I think, you know, I just had a recent conversation with the director of our local um, health and human services and um, she was reminding me as you are right now uh, all of us need to stay mindful of the fact that we have been anticipating this moment for a long time with great hope, um, and understandably so. However, in many ways, the hardest work is just starting right now. And you've just done a good job of, of describing, um, you know, you know, in, in still relatively general terms without getting too far into the weeds, describing just how complicated and interlocking um, so many different um, kind of components that need to work together and work well um, in order for all of this to unfold in a way that I think many, many people out here in the, you know, in the public just kind of waiting, oh, vaccines here, oh, good everything's going to be fine now. Um, mm. No, lots and lots of challenges coming up here. Yeah. Yep. Um, can I ask you one question, one more question about that, and then we will sure. move on. And that is, um, I know there is great concern on a national level for uh, one of the things that people are most concerned about is how much um, compliance or how much uh, people are going to be willing to, uh, to take the vaccine um, even if they are among those populations who are um, considered most vulnerable, first in line, et cetera. Um, is that much, is that a big concern here in Massachusetts? My sense would be not so much that people, if they would qualify, they would take it. You wouldn't have to worry about overcoming their resistance, but I may be wrong about that. It is a huge issue. And it is actually something that the advisory committee is also been tasked with, which is how to, you know, what needs to be done on the state level to um, engage people in getting a vaccine. I think uh, SCIU 1199, which represents a lot of healthcare workers, um, did a, a poll and they came up with some very alarming numbers around uh, how many people said they didn't, they wouldn't take the vaccine. Now, that's not necessarily uncommon when something first comes out. Um, it is very, very important that community leaders are engaged in, um, in helping their communities to feel more comfortable about the vaccine. That's why on the advisory committee, there were um, community leaders like um, Reverend Elizabeth Walker and Michael Curry and, um, and others who represent communities where there is a high um, level of concern about whether to trust the vaccine. Um, that's why they were on, they are on this committee so that they can help to inform the governor about how to go about this, but also become spokespeople. What we found is that as people take the vaccine, so the first the first group of people are healthcare workers, okay? They are people in direct contact with people who have COVID. For instance, doctors, nurses, uh, environmental service people, food people, people in hospitals who deal directly, everybody, doesn't matter who you are, they get first, sh they get first shot at the vaccine. <laughs> um, what we find is that as people take it, 
more people take it. Mm -hmm. So, and and right now the hospitals are reporting that their their healthcare workers across the board are signing up to get it. So it's a big concern, um, especially when you're fighting the internet and all of the noise that goes out um, around different theories and people's personal opinions. Um, but uh, I think we, we've acknowledged that and we have work to do, but I think we'll be able to do it. I think it is a safe vaccine. And um, I think we have to do, we have to, we have to be vaccinated. We're not going to get away with this. We're not going to get rid of this pandemic unless we, unless we get vaccinated. So all right. I, 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 I realize I could talk to you a lot more about this very topic and we need to move on. So um, we will hold that for another day. Sure. Um, we uh, are talking to you in uh, mid-December now. And so it's an appropriate moment, I think, for us to ask you to look back on what everybody acknowledges has been an infernal year. Yes. Um, and one that we'd all like to blot off our calendars, um, you know, forever. Uh, however, accomplishments were made nonetheless. Um, sure. and, uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a kind of a, a run through uh, the stuff that you guys have been able to do uh, in the state house over the course and specifically in the Senate over the course of 2020. Sure. Well, you know, maybe it's a little more than 2020. It's more the session, but you know, because things oh, right, move into one from one year to the next. But I, I think it actually, in some ways, was an extraordinary year. We uh, we passed a couple really important pieces of legislation. One of them was breakfast after the bell, um, where is uh, that um, children will get breakfast. All children will get breakfast in schools. Um, uh, if they're part of a uh, of a community that has a certain number of low income um, students, and um, what's really fascinating, James, is, and I think I said this the last time we were together, that one of the most profound learnings that have come out of COVID is that schools feed our children, and when they don't go to school, they don't get food. And that is both, it's, it's, I'm not sure what to say about that, um, but whether or not, uh, what level you think that that is, uh, it's the truth. And so we need to make sure that when children are in school, that everybody gets access to good um, uh, food while we address the problem of food insecurity for families. Um, so that was one of the things that we passed that was signed in the law. Um, the Senate did a Patients First Act, which um, addressed um, telehealth, scope of practice um, for uh, licensing um, out of network. Um, it was a great bill. Um, also had something in there to analyze the effect of COVID-19 on our healthcare system and where we um, have gaps. Um, these are just a couple of the things that were in it. Uh, the um, uh, House passed their own version, and we have been in. I have been in conference with uh, um, the House on that bill, and hope that we will have something out soon. Um, so I'm, I'm very, um, um, I'm, I'm hopeful for that. I think we're, I think we're going to get there. Um, we passed this. This uh, Senate passed a step therapy reform bill, which. Um, step therapy is the practice where insurers uh, insist that people take certain levels of drugs or treatment before they can take the one that their doctor believes will be the most effective. It's a pretty um, uh, harsh uh, policy. And the Senate passed us to reform, passed a reform for that. So basically, if you are somebody um, who needs a medication because your doctor believes it's in the best interest of your health, that um, that you will get that, and this is especially true for people who have chronic illnesses. Um, multiple sclerosis is one of the, the uh, illnesses that's affected. Um, if you change an insurer, they make you start from the beginning. You end up having to take medication that you know won't help you, um, and it often has an adverse effect. So um, that was uh, um, 
So that's something that we passed. We also passed an economic development recovery bill um, that um, addresses small businesses, communities, um, uh, and, and really the economic devastation that's caused by the, by the pandemic. Um, and that is also something that is in conference and hopefully that's where we will come to an agreement and that is where we're gonna see um, a support for small businesses, for um, renters, for, for landlords, for you know, um, money and money to help uh, um, with the economic impacts of the, of the um, pandemic, which have been, um, uh, which have been profound. Um, we did a, a, quack, a quack Walker Day resolution, which is, um, was brought to us by the town of uh, Lexington. And um, it is a part important part of, of black history and, um, and that um, we were asked to, can we acknowledge this along with, um, uh, it's an emancipation proclamation and, uh, and um, we passed that. And so we're looking forward to a Quack Walker day. And I bring it up because it was really spurred on by one of my constituents in Lexington. And so we're, we're very grateful. Uh, we did a maternal health bill. We did a female uh, genital mutilation bill. Um, so those are some of the things that we did in the, in the Senate. Um, we did a mental health bill, the ABC Act, um, which uh, one of the things that I'm quite proud of in that is um, that we have a big piece on mental health parity requiring there be parity between the way we treat behavioral health and the way we treat med surge. Hopefully our audience takes away from that, um, that extensive list, uh, the sense that, you know, of the kinds of things that did get done, but also the priorities that underlie uh, those bills that have either been passed or are currently in conference committee and on their way to being passed. I know and I'm going to stop saying this because I'm sure I could at every five minute interval in our conversation, uh, but I will say one more time that everything you said deserves more unpacking. And I uh, personally am curious to know more of the details, sure. um, but for our purposes today and within the time constraints that we have, we're just going to have to keep moving on. Okay. Um, and just to tell you, uh, there is quite a bit of detail on, on my website. Um, so really you, good. you can go there and you can click on these and it'll give you a, a much an in, a in depth um, overview of what the, of what each of these bills have done. That is, uh, I'm very, very glad you mentioned that because of course, people's curiosity, I'm sure will be piqued by various things you mentioned. Uh, if they can find out more um, simply by going to your website, great. Um, all right, so that brings us up uh, to the current moment and there are several uh, things that I want to ask you about, just different topic areas basically, um, and uh, just get either your thoughts or uh, an update about what's going on in those areas. Um, the first is that the budget has been uh, hanging over your heads uh, for, uh, I know you and I talk every couple of months, every few months, and I believe we have talked about, this will be the third uh, time, um, so probably at least six months back, if not more, that we have talked about the budget and it is not yet. Uh, it is on the governor's desk, I believe, is that right? Uh -huh. um, so, let's just assume it's going to get passed. Um, and uh, what are the impacts that Arlingtonians in particular should um, should take note of? It's a it's a really good budget. And what the budget really focuses on, the budget focuses on is ensuring that certain basic services, basic needs are met by the common people of the Commonwealth during this pandemic. Um, and that's in housing, education, food, um, healthcare. Um, and one of the things that we um, really made sure of was that we 
do as much as we can to mitigate any of the impacts on our local communities. So we uh, did not cut, uh, we, we met our commitment for uh, local aid, which is unrestricted government funding and um, chapter 70 plus a, a, a small uh, increase in, um, in, co in uh, cost of living or inflation, which there wasn't very much of, but um, so those two things were Chapter 70 and then just for everybody. Sorry, chapter yeah. 70 is education funding, I apologize. So those were held harmless. And so the, um, the, the communities, the municipalities got what they were expecting. Um, and the governor hasn't signed it, but I would bet anybody a lot of dollars that he will keep that hold. I, I know he will, because I think there's, there's, been, I, there's been an agreement. Um, so I think Arlington can depend on that, has depended on it, and I think that that's good news for all the municipalities. Absolutely. Um, uh, in addition, we've done a lot of work around um, housing security and trying to uh, make sure that um, people can stay in their homes. Didn't do as much as the Senate wanted, but um, I think we did some good work around that. There's an enormous uh, investment in the rental assistance for people and we've raised the cap. Um, we've also done some work around ensuring that as you go through an eviction process, there are times early on in that process where, where we can um, basically put a hold on it while uh, people try and get uh, the support that they need. Um, we've um, made it clear for people that who get in an early eviction notice, which is called a force to quit, that they know they don't have to leave their rental. It is just an initial notice. You should not leave your house if you get a notice to quit. Um, we've made that clearer. And there's um, uh, some more money we put in for rapid rehousing for people who are homeless. So we've done a lot around the housing. Again, we need to do more, but we did, it was a good start. Um, we um, have put an enormous amount of money into food security, food programs have been, not only were they funded in the SUP budget, but they've also been funded in, in this particular, in the FY90 SUP budget, it is a, is a small budget that comes out during the year to make whole certain accounts. We've added money, we added money to those accounts and we'll continue, we did it in the, in the FY21 budget too. Um, we, um, so there's the housing stability, um, education. Um, we did a, um, we put in a lot of money and this is something that I worked very hard on, on mental health and behavioral health to make sure that those um, programs and money was not cut. Um, we got an additional $10 million in the budget to help uh, hospitals and acute care centers add more behavioral health beds. This is really important because what we're seeing in the emergency rooms, people coming in, a vast number of people coming into emergency rooms right now have serious, significant mental health um, conditions and they have no place to go. There's no bed for them anywhere. So this is, this is really important um, for the hospitals as well as for um, people coming in and seeking care. So that's some of the things that are in the budget. I think um, I'm also very pleased that I, um, that I got money for Arlington Youth um, Counseling Center um, so that they can continue the really important work that they do um, for Arlington for children and families. Um, that is in the budget as well. So that's just some of the things that I can think of at the mm -hmm. moment, but. Well, you know, really there's good. a lot of reassuring news in what you just said, both for mm -hmm. Arlington and for other towns and municipalities in Massachusetts, no doubt. Yeah. But, to me, I have to say it begs the question a, a little bit. Um, given the um, economic circumstances and the public health and economic emergency that we are have been in for a long time now, surely something must have been sacrificed or need to be sacrificed in this budget as well. You have just outlined a bunch of things that are either going to stay as they've been uh, and that we rely on, or that you've even you know, invested more uh, in order to be able to help vulnerable populations of different sorts. All great news. What's the bad news? Is there bad news? Um, so the, the, 
the bad news and where where do we get this from? Well, a big portion of where we, uh, there are a couple of things actually. First one is we took a significant amount of money out of the rainy day fund, also known as the stabilization fund. This is money that we put, the state puts in every year um, to hold for a rainy day. And I think you could argue that it's not only raining, it's pouring, there's thunder, there's lightning and possibly a tornado coming. So um, I, I think about, we had a $3 million, I think $3 billion gap, I think, which was much lower than we thought was gonna be um, in part because of what the federal government did in terms of unemployment um, uh, insurance. Um, so we took uh, um, over a billion and a half dollars out of the rainy day fund. Um, and that really helped to mitigate um, some of these um, issues, uh, some of the, the uh, spending. Um, we did spend on, a, on some things that I think were really important. Um, we didn't spend, we were unable to get money for emergency paid sick leave, um, which was a, would have costed quite a bit of money um, we, we weren't able to get that into the budget. We're not done fighting. Um, so that's something that I, I can point to that say we weren't successful um, and I wish we were. So be, between um, things that weren't, money that wasn't spent because of the budget, uh, because certain programs, there weren't people there uh, uh, to use the programs, and because of the rainy day fund, we were able to put together a package that really re uh, allowed us to do spending in the areas that I talked about. So it was kind of a mix of um, spending more money, taking money out of the rainy day fund, um, save, having saved some money because some programs weren't being used. So we had money left over um, and other things you can do, you know, to move money around so that you keep people whole. Well, um, interesting to note for, for, for me um, that uh, in our previous conversation uh, back a few months ago, again, um, you know, we had touched on the rainy day fund, but you hadn't made that decision to, to dip right. into it at that point. So um, just interesting to know that that is one of the things that's happened over these last months. It was a big piece of it and the right thing to do, I believe. Um, Moving on, Cindy, uh, one um, of the many systems that have been profoundly disrupted uh, by the pandemic is our education system. And that is affecting, it's reaching into every household um, with school aged children um, in the Commonwealth. And there are any number of concerns that we could talk about, but I was specifically wanting to ask you, uh, about the situation with the MCAS um, for, you know, students who are, who would be taking it at different points, but especially those who are seniors and for whom uh, the MCAS represents the ability to move on or not. Um, this has a, been an insane um, school year. Um, and so what kind of accommodations uh, are, is the government considering making uh, to acknowledge the, these crazy circumstances and, and not penalize students if possible. Right now, the Department of Education um, has been very clear that there will be high stakes MCAS and, um, for seniors. And um, I think this is something that a number of us are very, very concerned about. And um, there is a lot of active discussion going on. Um, I. I, 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 I think there may be reasons why um, good and thoughtful people want to have this happen. My uh, concern is that we don't have a standardized system across the Commonwealth. Everybody is not learning the same thing remotely. Everybody is not all remote or all in uh, person. We don't have access to the same level of technology in terms of internet and computers and who is with you at home, who isn't with you at home if you're remote, um, what your remote learning is like versus what somebody in Pittsfield's remote learning is like. I mean, there's just, 
there, there's so many um, unknowns and so many discrepancies between when you look up, when you want to look across a standardized system is everybody getting the same access and the same substance. Um, we know they're not. Um, this has really been going on for numbers of students since March when we closed schools in late March, right? Um, and so I don't understand how we um, how we can um, expect that we're going to give a high stakes test to seniors who for many of them have been out now for almost a year and that's somehow fair or is going to give us a good metric of whether these students have learned or not. Um, there's lots of controversy around the MCAS to start with. I fundamentally believe in some form of um, standardized testing because we need to understand that uh, we're delivering an education system that's equal for everybody. Um, but in this, and we can have that argument with people, and, but, um, but this one, it, it, it really has my head scratch. I'm really scratching my head on this one. I don't understand how this is equitable or fair for students. It's a huge, it's a very high stake. It means you don't get um, a, uh, you know, you don't get a diploma. High school diploma, right. It's like- so it, it, it Don't get any higher uh, for, you know, an 18 year old, uh, you know, in the Commonwealth. Um, we have people in the Commonwealth who don't have internet access. They're talking about taking the, these MCAS tests in a, in a uh, parking lot because they can't get, you know, we don't even have equal, equity about around technology across our state. So I'm really scratching my head on this one. And I think there's going to be a lot of discussion and I really have to understand what the thinking is to go ahead. So. Okay. Um, one uh, huge thing that uh, has been in the headlines recently, uh, a huge piece of legislation, new piece of legislation um, yet to come to total fruition. Uh, it's going back and forth between the governor and the legislature as we speak. Um, and that is the police reform bill that I know you didn't have your fingers on directly, but I can't not ask you about um, given its high profile and the fact that it is, seems to be, you know, things seem to be unfolding as, as I said, as we speak. Well, the governor sent it back. Um, I haven't, read his letter in detail. The letter is what he sends back where he says, I, I don't like these sections. I, you know, I would veto the bill if these don't get fixed, I think is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to see, I, you know, I, I again, I'm not, um, I'm not really, uh, I haven't done the homework of exactly what the issues are, so I can't really speak more than that. He did, he, it came back yesterday and I haven't had a chance, but um, it's certainly something that we're going to have to take up. I know that there were parts of the bill that he really liked, and um, so I think we have to figure out as a body how we're, how we're going to move ahead. And I know that the people who have been, you know, the, the sponsors and the people have been leading this um, bill through the um, bodies are, are working on it. That's really the best I can tell you right now. Fair enough. Um, as I said, couldn't not ask, even though I, I figured you, yeah. you might not have um, too much to say about it. And um, let me let me wrap things up because we've taken up a lot of your time already by asking you about something you and I have talked about uh, before um, during the pandemic and in general, and that is the relationship um, fiscal and otherwise between the federal government and what the federal government is or isn't doing and what we need here in Massachusetts. So um, right now there are negotiations going on in Washington as there seem to always be um, in which one of the real sticking points uh, between Democrats and Republicans has to do with the amount of aid to be provided to states like Massachusetts. Um, Please make it clear for our audience uh, just how significant this is uh, for us here in Massachusetts, the resolution and hopefully the resolution in favor of providing more aid uh, to state uh, governments. Um, 
why does why does that matter so much to us? We have managed to get through this year and have a budget that goes to um, June, July of 2021 because um, of help from the federal government uh, through the CARES Act and um, some other mechanisms and through unemployment. Um, we have been able to get through um, without, excuse me, without, um, uh, you know, somewhat whole, okay? It's been an enormous Im impact on our businesses and our communities. I, I don't question that for a minute, but we can't go on anymore. We are not allowed to run a deficit as a state. We can't just spend money to keep people whole. And we need to keep people whole, not only for their economic stability, but for their health. And if we don't have help from the federal government, we can't do that. And it's also a philosophy between whether or not you believe in government. And I think what we're seeing here is at the federal level, there are people who are in our government, who are elected officials who don't believe in government. And they are happy to starve our states and our municipalities who pay for our police, who pay for our fire, who, who take care of our streets, who um, uh, uh, educate our children, who keep our libraries open, right? Do all the things that we as a community of mass people from Massachusetts probably really care about, right? And that's what they're putting at stake. They wanna say, forget the government, don't fund it, fire everybody, we'll be okay. And that is not how you run a business and not how you run a government. And if you don't believe how important it is, look at what's happening when we don't have a federal government who is competent enough to take care of us in the middle of a pandemic. We as the state have been left on our own and the federal government has just said, We're, we don't care, we don't care. And so we need, we need the federal government to step up and help all of us, whether you care about you know, your schools, whether you care, whether you're a Republican or whether you're a Democrat, we are in a crisis and we have to get help from our federal government. That is their job. And so we have done everything we can. And, you know, I am a Democrat through and through, but I think our, our state government um, has done an enormous amount of work to keep us safe and try in the worst of situations to keep our economy going. It's not perfect. It, you know, there's lots of good, bad decisions that you have to make. And we've done what we can. And now it's time for our federal government to say, forget who you are, whether you're Republican or Democrat, and let's take care of our people. And that's why it is so critical. We can't go on without that help. We just can't. Our economy will crash in, in Massachusetts. I believe that. So that's, I don't know how else to say it. Well, I'm not sure if you need uh, to say anything else about that in that that's a very forceful and uh, to my ears persuasive uh, argument for some uh, clear and constructive federal action. Fingers crossed. Yes. Um, okay, we uh, had you and I had spoken before we went on camera just about how uh, tired uh, we are, all of us are. Um, and yet, uh, you have provided us with a good 40 or 45 minutes of substantive content, as always. I asked, I told you we appreciated your time at the beginning. I will just reiterate one more time before we go that really this is valuable for our audience and for, for, for me personally. I appreciate it, of course. Um, and we know that it takes a toll on you. So thank you. Well, thank um, you. It's a great forum to. I love talking to you and also it's great that I get an opportunity to do this so people can, my constituents can know what's going on. All right, I hope sincerely that you can find some time in the next few weeks to get some R&R &R 
before you're right back uh, in the battle. Um, and um, with that, uh, happy holidays, Cindy. Happy New Year. Thank you. You uh, too. And let us all hope that 2021 brings a completely different tone and flavor to our lives. Amen. And then we share that with you going forward. Yes, thank you. And you be safe too, and um, your family. And I hope we can all find some joy and satisfaction in the coming year. Thank you very much. I have been speaking with our state senator, Cindy Friedman, at length. <laughs> Again, appreciatively. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. Appreciate your being here and we'll see you next time.